What's going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to learn to rebuild the classic iOS app Doodle Jump in Python using Pygame. Okay, so uh, Doodle Jump, you're probably familiar with it if you're uh, over the age of eight. Um, and no shade if you're not over the age of eight, but this was like one of the first viral iPhone apps. Um, and it's basically just an endless jumper where your character is just constantly jumping from platform to platform. There have been 10 million versions of this game made over the, um, o over the years that followed, but this was really the OG. And if you want to make a game of this style but not kind of rip off Doodle Jump, because you would not be able to share this in any kind of commercial way, um, I grabbed a little image of the guy from the actual original app on the internet. You can grab um, any image or make your own that's not copyright uh, infringed and uh, use that to make yours. But I'm just doing this for a tutorial, so um, let's get into it. The first thing for any Pygame uh, game is so you're going to want to import the Pygame module and then you're going to want to do pygame.init. The, these are like the first two steps if you're building a game, initialize Pygame because uh, you're going to use basically all of the game functionality um, that comes with that module. So first thing we're going to do is just get the player drawn onto the screen and uh, create the screen and then um, build some of the platforms that you jump on. And then we'll start working into like game mechanics and updates and things like that. So to do that, you're going to import Pygame, do pygame.init. Um, I like to create kind of a library of game constants for pretty much every game because uh, all of the colors in Pygame are RGB style. And a lot of the times when it's time to define a color, I like to just write white or black. I mean, you probably, if you've done a bit of coding, you probably know like some of the basics. Um, but I, I like to, to define a few just, uh, just here in the beginning. So, okay, and then I'm gonna actually throw down a gray as well. Um, because I want the platforms to not necessarily be white or black. And um, then we're going to do screen width and screen height in here just because that's something that uh, if I want to change easily later, it's a little bit easier to use um, width and height as a adjustable constant here than go and track down every place that it may have been. So 400 by 500 looks pretty good, but obviously you building your own version of this game, make it whatever size uh, you like looking at. And I think just to get the screen made, that's all we have to do here. A few things I want to do because our player is an image. Um, if you have an image that you would like for your player as well, um, I'll say a few things about this. If it's a PNG file or a JPEG that has a background, there's a website that'll remove the backgrounds of images for you for free. It's just like remove.bg. And if you type remove um, background from image into Google, it's probably the first result that'll come up. So if you have like an annoying white rectangle around the background of your character, just go to that website and they can strip the background for you. And then it's free to download. And just make sure you get the image in your uh, game folder so it's really easy to reference. Otherwise, you have to do like an OS file join, path join, and that's kind of irritating. So what I'm going to say, since we're still in the game, I did not spell constants, right? Um, since we're still in the game, uh, constants, I'm going to define the player. And if you want to pull in an image, uh, you do pygame.image.load. And then you um, load, and then you put in the uh, quotations, you put the name of the image. And you can actually see if it's in your folder and you're using a good IDE um, like PyCharm, then it'll auto-populate with the image files that are um, in there. So just start typing the name of your file. It should show up in some of the IDEs, even if you hover over them like this one, it'll show you a little preview of what it's going to look like. Um, and now I'm going to keep it this size. I'm not going to transform it yet. I'm just going to keep it at whatever size it is. But once we draw it onto the screen, you'll see this is actually going to be huge. We're going to come back to this and scale it later. 
Um, and then a few other constants we should define. Let's define a frame rate. Um, and I'll talk about this when I'm dropping it into the game loop. But you want to ensure that this game runs at a constant speed no matter what device you're running it on. Because if you have like a high-end computer that can get you 130 frames per second, then this might be running really fast. And if you're playing on an older device and you're down at like 30 frames, um, this game could become really easy because it's so slow. You want to ensure like a fair um, gameplay. So just define an FPS of 60. We're going to define a font right here in the beginning. So anytime we want to put text in the game, we already have uh, something defined. Because Pygame just dropping text in isn't actually super easy. You have to like define the text and then you have to draw it onto the screen. Um, I like using Free Sans Bold just as a default. If it's for like a, a passion project or you really want to like roll this game out on a website or something, um, maybe import your own TTF file. Uh, that's a font file and you can put it in your um, assets folder as well just like the image and then you can reference a font here as well even if you make a custom font. Um, and then after you uh, call the font file, you then give it a font size. So if you do want like title text that's huge and then you want like score text that's smaller and instruction text in a menu, you can um, define all these different fonts. For this tutorial, I'm just going to use one. Um, but just know you could do like, you could call this um, score font and then you could have another one called title font, something like that. I'm going to use this for all of my text. So... Uh, just a little background for you there. And then because we want an internal clock um, regulating that frame rate, we're also going to define a timer here in the beginning, pygame.time.clock. Uh, I know this isn't really like the exciting part of creating a game, but having these things at the beginning of pretty much every game, like what's on screen right now, you're probably going to want in just about any game you're going to make with Python and Pygame. Um, so apologies if you've seen all of this before and you want to specifically doodle jump pieces, but this stuff is really important. So, okay, let's go ahead and create the screen now. Um, and I, you, you don't have to name it screen, but you should name it something logical. Uh, while well, I'm having trouble spelling today. Uh, you should name it something logical because, like, um, you have to use this pygame.display.setMode and then give it the screen size, which we made, uh, what was it, width and then height. Width comma height, you absolutely could punch just 400 and 500 in here as constants um, if you want. But then anytime you need to reference the size of the screen later on, you'll need to know those constants. So, okay, um, we're going to call that screen and we're going to be drawing a bunch of stuff onto the screen during the course of this game. So. Uh, let's go ahead and also give ourselves a caption, pygame.display.setCaption, there it is. Uh, give yourself quotes, and we'll call it Doodle Jumper, just different enough to not get sued. Um, okay, so that's it for creating the screen. Let's go ahead and make the game loop. And basically, every game is going to have this when you start it up, set running equal to true, and then your main game loop is while running equals true. That is basically how you get the game started, and to make sure that this isn't an infinite loop, I would right away, I would put some event handling in, that's just for event in pygame dot, uh, event dot get. And some of the, whenever you see Pygame at the beginning of it, um, we are dealing with like the caption, the mode, we're dealing with sp specific syntax for Pygame. So um, you'll kind of just remember it or you'll have it in a file or you'll find it on GitHub, GitHub or Reddit um, or Stack Overflow. But uh, if you see Pygame.anything, that's specific Pygame syntax uh, and you just kind of need to know it. So for event in pygame.event.get, this is all of our event handling for the whole game. And first thing we want to check is just if event.type is equal to pygame.quit, then what are we going to do? We're going to set running equal to false. So uh, every pygame screen has the little red X in the top corner that you're familiar with seeing um, on your operating system. And this is no different. So that button is pygame.quit. And uh, that's, this is how you handle 
that X button actually closing out of your program, making sure you don't have an infinite loop. So that's useful information to know. And then a few things that we have to do here in our game loop um, just to get something to show up. First, we're going to do timer.tick at our frame rate, and that's going to control the speed, the number of loops per second that this program will run at. And then we're going to do just screen.fill with um, a background color. And so to start out, I'm going to make it white, um, but I do want the background color to be a variable because uh, I think that during the course of the game, as you get like a higher and higher score, we may want to change the background as like a fun um, variation thing. So I'm going to actually just to start, I'm going to make a variable, call it the background, and then I'm going to set equal to white to start the game. But we'll see, making it this variable means that we can play around with it later in the game. And uh, So throwing a color or an image in a background variable is not a bad idea if that's something you'll want to change during the course of your game. And let's see, so we've got screen.fill.background, and uh, let's get it to where we can just open up a screen. So we need to do pygame.display.flip, which just kind of takes everything we drew, throws it onto the screen in the proper order, and then last thing in your program, pygame.quit. And this, uh, what we've just created, I know it took 10 minutes, but we created the shell of almost any game you're going to create. You can play around with the title, you can play around with some of the sizing variables, but this is really how you set up your game. Let's go ahead and run it, and you can see we just get roughly like a application-sized screen. We could make it taller, we could make it wider, but um, this should be good for starting to build our uh, stuff in. So let's go ahead and get the player drawn on next. That'll be kind of the next step now that we've set up the, the shell of basic code we need. Um, and you really could, like, you could screenshot this screen right here and basically just have this in a notepad or in a pie file and throw it into every program that you're going to create because this is not a bad place to start from when you're building a game. Okay, so uh, we already have the player defined as this image, and all we have to do to get it on the screen is we're going to do uh, a, what's called a block transfer or a blit, um, and that's Pygame's method of drawing something into the screen. So we are going to do screen.blit right under the background, and order does matter when you're drawing something, so if you were to do screen.blit um, and then uh, do this before the background getting filled in, it would draw your player image onto the screen, but then it's going to fill the screen with the background color, and so you're actually never going to see your player. So order is important. If you ever have an issue where something's not showing up, you may have it getting drawn on before something else that's actually covering it. Okay, so uh, what we've got here, screen.blit, and then uh, first thing you give it is what it's drawing. Um, so we said draw it onto the screen, that's why it's a screen.blit, and then we say draw the player, and then we need to give it position, so we need to give it coordinates here, um, and that's going to be, we could give it um, constants, but because if you think about it, your player is going to be moving the whole game, uh, I propose that we make those into variables, and let's go up into, so we have game constants, and then we have the screen. Let's make a new section and call it game variables, and these will be things that are really changing constantly as part of game functionality. So to start, um, let's just pick a position to put the player right in the beginning, and this can change later on. It will change because you'll be jumping. Um, and if we don't like it while we're troubleshooting, we can just scoot it around a little bit here and there. But let's put it at 170 and 40 and see if we get a doodle on the screen. So <laughs> what you can kind of see is just the corner of this guy because we have a huge image. If you open this back up, it is massive. So this is what I said a little bit earlier in. Um, we need to add something to when we load in our player image. We need to add what's called a scale. Um, and that's pygame.transform.scale, and then put that whole first phrase, oh, you got to spell it right, put that first phrase, that pygame.image.load, 
inside of parentheses for the pygame.transform.scale, and then you do a column, and then you give it the scale that you want it to be inside additional parentheses here. So um, I'm going to shrink it down to about 90 by 70. Whatever image you brought in, you may need to uh, scale it differently, but you can see um, that takes my huge original doodle jump image and it brings it down to a, a pretty manageable size. I like it this size. Um, so we're going to go with that size guy going forward. And what we'll notice during the gameplay is a lot of the time there's like one pixel or something in an image that sticks out further than others. So once we're into the jumping phase of this game, uh, you may actually want to make like the collision detection smaller than the overall size of your image but we're getting ahead of ourselves for where we are right now. Um, and the next really important part of a uh, jumper is drawing in the platforms. And so in game variables, why don't we uh, initialize a list that we'll call platforms and let's draw in some to start. So uh, this list I think we're going to use during the game every time a, a platform goes off the screen to the bottom because the player's jumping higher and higher. We'll remove it from this list, and at that point, we'll add a new platform to the list at the top of the list. So uh, to get started, because you want to make sure when you start the game, your player is not going to immediately die, I'm going to draw a platform kind of directly below, uh, directly below the player, and um, we're going to add a few additional platforms to here, but to get started, I really just want to get this first one on the screen so that we can see where it is um, and use that as a basis for drawing the rest of them. So what, what we need to do is we need to come down where we're drawing things and we need to say for i in range and we want this range to be the length of our platforms list because as many platforms as are in that list of coordinates that we just gave it, um, we want it our loop to cycle through that list and uh, oh, you need parentheses here. We want our code to cycle through the list of platforms and make sure that it's drawing an object on the screen for everything in that range. Um, so for I in range length of platforms uh, what do we want to do? We want to draw something that I'll call block because they're going to basically be rectangles. pygame.draw.rect and we want to put it on the screen. I need to spell things correctly. Put it on the screen. Let's make them black uh, to start. And then um, the actual coordinates. So I should have explained when I made this platform. I'm giving it four coordinates to fully define a platform as, um, as this style, this like four uh, coordinates inside of brackets. And what we're doing is we're putting lists inside of a list. Um, it may sound confusing, but the reason we do that is when you use the pygame.draw.rect, it needs four coordinates to fully define a rectangle. So we can use um, this indexer and say, first you say what screen to put it on, what color to draw the object, and then it needs um, its x position and y position, and then its width and its height. And so what we have here is we're saying um, put the top left corner of the rectangle at coordinate 175, 480, and then make it 70 wide and 10 tall. So I should have explained that a little more when I created the platform uh, list, but that is what we're defining. So we can come down in our pygame.draw.rect screen, um, say what color it's going to be, and then give it the rectangular coordinates that it needs. Um, and then we called this block. We are going to want to keep track of our list of blocks because this is different than, um, than just a list of coordinates. This is just going to be our list of the coordinates of the platforms. And I want this blocks list to be a list of all of the actual rectangular objects because we're going to take advantage in a little bit of Pygame's built-in um, rectangular collision function. So we're going to just uh, add to the blocks list, which we are going to initiate in our game loop as an empty list. And we're going to add each individual rectangle as it gets drawn to a blocks list. 
If it doesn't make a ton of sense why we're doing it that way right now, it will once we get to the jumping and the collision detection. But uh, let's see if this is enough to draw that first rectangle onto the screen or if we're going to get some errors. Yeah, so, okay, there it is. It's right under the player, so when the game starts, the player's going to drop, and then kind of that infinite jumping motion that Doodle Jump is famous for is going to start up right away when the game starts. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, maybe just one stylistic thing here. The, like, Doodle Jump platforms are typically... Um, rounded rectangles and if we want to do that we just need to give it a few more parameters we give it a zero for width because that's actually edge width and I'll show it real quick if we were to give that a number it's going to be a hollow rectangle and then we give it a border radius which is defining how rounded it is so you can kind of see here it's hard to see because I gave it a width of one it's going to be like wireframe and as we increase that width let's say we went up to two or three it's going to become a blocky rounded rectangle. Um, and actually, if we make that a 3, it looks a little better. But if we want to be a solid rounded rectangle, just give it a 0, saying it's it needs to be completely filled in. So now you can see we get this fun, nicely rounded, uh, full rectangle. And um, I think that looks pretty good. It certainly looks a lot closer to the actual like Doodle Jump Origins. And now any platform that we draw in will have these features. That's the real power of putting it in a for loop. Because if we were to, let's say we have 12 platforms on the screen at once, and we didn't have that in a loop, you're going to have 12 statements that are writing one rectangle on the screen and controlling the spacing of it. So um, the next thing I want to do is I actually want to get the like infinite jumping action going. Um, and to do that, I propose we use a, uh, a function that's going to check the position of the player as well as the position of all the platforms, and it's going to handle whether or not it's time to jump. Um, and so for that, I'm going to create a function that I will call update player, and we're going to run this every single loop. So um, because the player is constantly moving in this game, um, okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and update the player's position. And I think to do that in this function, all we're going to do is pass in the player's y-coordinate. And all we should expect to get back is going to be the player's y-coordinate. So we're going to use this to control the up and down motion of the player. And we're going to run it once every loop. Let's come up here and actually define it and just leave ourselves a comment saying update player y position every loop. And we use def to define a function, and we're going to call it update player. And then what we're expecting in is y position. And what is the update player function going to look like? It is going to basically check if we are uh, in a position where we need to jump, and if we do need to jump, then we're going to uh, send it upwards. But to build a realistic looking jump, like what you might have seen in the beginning of this video, we need to have a few variables. We need to have like some jump height that's going to co um, determine how high the player bounces every time. And so I'm going to call that just 10 for now, and we can tweak these things later if we want. And then we need a gravity variable. Um, and the gravity is going to be something that checks, uh, and, and it's going to affect it in like a quadratic function, just like regular gravity would. You start by going up very, very fast, but gravity is weighing on you every second. And then as you start coming downward, gravity is going to compound and add to that as well. So we need to create some jump height and gravity in this function. And uh, we are actually going to want to call in a few globals as well. We could pass them in, um, but I don't think that necessarily is going to clean up the code. I think it may complicate it. And as long as we're not going to modify them in here, calling in globals is just fine. So we're going to call in a few things that we need to go create in game variables called jump, which is a true false just telling us whether or not it's time to do a jump. And so to start out, that's going to be false because the player's not in a position to jump. 
and then we're going to create a variable called y change, which is how we'll actually um, determine what should happen with the player's vertical position. And so we'll make it zero to start because gravity should kick in immediately, start dragging the player downward. Um, so once we've referenced those as globals, then we'll just take our y position and we'll basically say if we, it is time to jump, then we want y change to be equal to, and this is where things might start getting a little bit confusing if you haven't seen Pygame before. The coordinate system in Pygame is such that 0, 0 is the top left corner. So if you want a jump, what you actually want is the Y coordinate to become smaller. So if you're at, let's say, Y coordinate 300, you're fairly close to the middle, lower bottom of the screen. When it's time to jump, you want to go towards 290, 280, 270, and that number decreasing. So we made jump height positive just so it's a little clearer to track, um, but that means that we need to make Y change equal to negative jump height so that we're changing by negative 10. Um, and that may be a little bit confusing, but uh, bear with me. And then we're going to set jump equal to false immediately because we only want this to happen one loop. So we basically, when it's time to jump, which will be when the player collides with a platform, we want one scan where it says, okay, it's time to jump, start sending the player upward, it should no longer be colliding with the platform, and then we set that jump variable equal to false. Uh, so that's how we're going to handle that, and then we can come out of that if statement. Oops, you stay in there come out of that if statement and we're still in the players um, the player function here and we're gonna say that y position add on to it y change we're gonna do that every loop and then we're gonna change the y change variable by gravity so we're gonna add gravity to it um, and this should make sense for the kind of game we're building where you're constantly jumping. The player's not controlling when you jump. It's any time you hit a platform, you jump immediately, which means no matter what, gravity is affecting you every second. So you're going to constantly be going up 10, one scan later, up 9, one scan later, up 8, and then it's going to kind of arc in a quadratic fashion. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to change Y change by gravity, and then we're just going to return Y position. Return Y position. So, if you think back to the beginning of, oops, Y position plus equals Y change. Oh, see, I'm <laughs> I did Y change minus equal uh, 10, but that should say jump height if we want to modify it later. Um, you can hard code things, but if you notice inside of a function you have a grayed out local variable, then you probably did something wrong or you don't need that variable and you should just get rid of it um, because typically uh, grayed out means not in use and if you made a function with a variable that's not in use, then you put too much in your function. Okay, so I think this is the essence of handling what to do when we jump, but we haven't put in collision yet, so I want us to create another function that is going to run every second, checking whether or not every scan that's going to check whether or not it's time to jump, and what we're going to do there is we're going to check for collisions. Check collisions. I'm not the best at spelling. Um, and uh, what we're going to do in there is we're going to pass in our whole list of the blocks um, or the platforms rather and we are going to pass in all of those coordinates and we're going to see whether or not it's time to uh, it, whether or not it's time to jump based on whether or not the player's bottom is coming downward uh, and colliding with a rectangle. So this is an important part of doodle jump. You actually when you go vertical you want to be able to jump through a block and it's not until you're coming back down that we need to check that. And we'll see how the function we just wrote, checking for uh, updating the player, that's actually going to lead nicely into being able to do that. So let's go ahead and define our check collisions. And all we need to pass in here are our blocks and the variable jump. And what we're going to get back is jump. So let's go ahead up here and let's define another function. And we'll call this define check collisions and we are passing in the blocks list 
And so actually it's usually a good idea to um, uh, it's usually a good idea to use different variable names inside of your functions so that it doesn't shadow the outside scope and that's just a good way of that's a good way of keeping your functions um, separate from the outside world for troubleshooting later but you can you can reuse names if you want it shouldn't create errors for you um, and let's say check for collision with blocks it's a good idea to leave these comments in your code just to tell you what's going on in each section uh, if you were ever to pass this code on to someone else for them to work on it, don't make them go searching for what you're trying to do. Just tell them. And in check collisions, what we're going to do is we are going to uh, check the position of the player. So to do that, I'm going to call in player X and player Y. Um, there is a way to get the rectangle of an image and use that but I actually think that what we're going to do here is going to be a little more intuitive. Um, so we're going to call in a lot of globals because we're not modifying them in this program, but we do need to be able to access them. So I'm going to call in player X, player Y, and Y change. And if you remember what we just did, Y change is going to be telling you the direction of the player. So it will control how much physically you move per frame, but if Y change is positive, that means you're coming towards the bottom of the screen. And if Y change is negative, that means you're going upward towards the top of the screen. So we can actually use that as directional control for up or down. And you'll see why that matters right here. What we're checking is we're saying, again, for I in range, and it's this time it's going to be the length of the rectangle list that we just passed in, um, we're going to say if rect list at i and then we're going to use this collide rect um, function so this is python's built-in or pygames built-in rectangular collision tool and it checks to see if there's any point of overlap between two rectangles that you define so the first rectangle is the platform the second rectangle is going to be um, based off of the position of the player. So we'll say player X and player Y plus. This is an important one because if you just said player X, player Y, you're talking about a rectangle that starts at the top left of the player. But if you think about jumping, we actually want a rectangle that really only encompasses the space of your image's feet. So you want, uh, you want something that kind of incorporates the height of the player as well. So we'll say player Y plus 60. Now we're coming down 6 sevenths of the total height of your player. And we're just capturing the bottom 10 pixels or however many pixels. So this is the other piece of it. Um, you set a width and a height of the image that you want to collide with. And you can play with these later, but let's say we want it to be just 10, so that's approximately the height of the player's feet. Um, and then let's make it 90, because that's the full width of the player, but you'll see that's going to be something we'll modify later. Um, but then the other piece of this is we need to check also if jump is equal to false, because we do not care um, if, the, if they're already jumping. So if it's a scan where they're supposed to jump, we don't need to do this twice. So if jump is false and only if jump is false, and this is the other part where direction matters, and Y change is greater than zero, which means you're falling back downward. We don't want the player to collide with a platform on its way up and have that immediately boost them. It would look kind of silly. So now we're checking to see, is the player falling? Are we not already jumping? And did we collide with the feet of the player's image? And if that's true, then we put jump equals true and return jump. So no matter what, uh, we return jump every scan. Actually, sorry, it's called J in this function. Um, so we return jumping every scan, but it's going to be coming in as false. And the only thing that can make it true is if a platform collides with the feet of the player. So we want to actually scoot this return J back one indentation level. And let's go ahead and see. I 
think this is all we need to do to get our player bouncing. And you can see it looks kind of silly. And what that means, if he is bouncing, um, but it, you know, it doesn't really look like he's bouncing on the platform. It looks like he's bouncing above it. And it's going way too fast, um, right? Like he's barely coming off the ground. There's no way you're going to be able to get from platform to platform like that. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few variables. Um, to start, we can reduce the effect of gravity. So I'm going to cut it down to 0.4 and right away show you what that looks like. That, so that right there looks a little bit better. There is like an intermediate jump that's kind of weird. Um, but just to start, that's one thing we can do to improve this. Um, and then a uh, second thing is in our rectangle where we're determining where to uh, collide with the player, um, I think that we can start editing this guy a little bit to try to get it really true to like hitting the bottom of the image. Because like I said, if it's just grabbing the rectangle, um, then it may be looking at a few blank pixels below it. So there we can see it looks a little bit better. It does look like um, it does look like the feet are actually making contact with the platform. At least I'm going to say that it looks like the feet are making contact with the platform. Um, but we don't have like a really satisfying, smooth jumping motion just yet. So let's take a look here at what else we can do to modify that. Sorry about the confusion, but um, what I did here is I goofed up. It This should not be Y change minus equals jump height. This should be Y change equals negative jump height. So um, minus equals and plus equals are actually adding a value to itself. So this plus equals or minus equals is Python built in shorthand functionality for Y position equals Y position plus Y change. So this function is actually saying this, and I just use the shorthand. If you're unfamiliar with a lot of Python shorthand, um, you feel free to ask questions in the comments below. But what I had there before was stating Y change equals Y change minus jump height, which is why the Y change is uh, a little bit um, weird. So, um, so it actually needs to be Y change equals minus jump height. Okay, so we got the uh, the issue with our um, jump height figured out, and now we have what I actually like. It's a real smooth looking, um, just continuous jump. I'm going to bring that jump height down just a little bit, um, not 120, and we're going to make it 10. I think that that looks uh, a little bit better. Um, but really, you can mess around with the jump height, you can mess around with the gravity, figure out what works for you. And the next thing I want to do is kind of a twofer. I'd like to put more platforms in here, and then I'd also like to uh, add the player's ability to move back and forth, left and right. And that'll really create the key game mechanics. So uh, why don't we start with left and right for the player? Um, this is going to be kind of fun, and it'll be fairly simple, uh, fairly close to what we just did for the jump. But instead of uh, an automatic collision detection being what determines going left and right, we're going to add some lines of code to our event handling code, because now the player is going to be in control. Um, I kind of prefer for, uh, for computer games, I prefer directional control with WASD. You can use the arrow keys if you want. You can use any keys if you want. Um, I just, I prefer WASD, you get a little bit larger of a number pad, and that way if you want to do anything with like space or enter, you can use your right hand for that. So I'm going to include in here some code uh, checking for key up, so it would be like if event.type equals um, pi game, just like before, but instead of quit, it's going to be key up, or uh, actually first key down, key up is the opposite, it's when you release a key. Um, and so for key down, we're going to check and see what specific key is changed. So this is a little bit different because if the event is quit, you don't need any further conditions. It's always just the X and you always want to just close out um, the window. But if the key is, so we need another rung that's if event dot key is equal to, and this will be checking the actual key that was pressed. So pygame dot K, which is the shorthand for key, and then let's do A first, so that's going to the left. Okay, and if that's pressed, then what we want 
is we want a variable just like we made for the y direction called x change and we want that to become negative because we're going to the left and let's make it negative by player speed that way if we decide to do any like upgrades or, or power-ups or anything like that in the future um, we can just go ahead and do it with the player speed variable rather than having to come in here and change um, and modify and uh, the reason I'm doing it with player speed rather than the X position is so that I can come down here where we update the player Y position and just like with the um, once per scan we update the Y position we're also going to just add to the player X's position um, whatever the current X change is so it's it's a really easy line of code it's just plus equals X change and because we made this negative player speed and this positive player speed that takes care of it right there um, so let's go ahead and make those variables in our game variables section we'll say X change is equal to zero and let's give player speed uh, three initially um, that's a really easy thing to change down the line if we feel like the game is too hard or not hard enough you can modify things like the speed so okay that is all we need to get him moving but the problem is we need this whole section um, in key up format because obviously we want when you let go of a key that he should stop moving so here we can just say now if it's key up copy all of that code we did for a and d um, and if it's a key up let's just change the x change to zero so that should get him to stop moving when we start running and let's see that's yeah that's all we need to scoot left and right um, that looks pretty good one thing I want to do uh, wanted to point out is here you can see that he actually keeps jumping when he's far to the right of the platform again because of that kind of invisible box around the image um, so to modify that once you have a few platforms it's not a bad idea to go ahead and uh, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and modify the size of the rectangle that he's colliding with um, up in the collision detection so we made it 90 wide because when we scaled our image that's how wide the image was and we figured well let's just go with a uh, image about that wide with a rectangle about that wide but we can tell just from when we were jumping there he could be completely off the platform to the left or to the right and uh, it didn't look good so let's start with player X a little bit to the right and then let's make it just 40 wide because that was off by quite a bit and you can kind of test it by scooting all the way to where you think he should be falling on both sides and make sure it seems realistic so like there on the right side fall off it looked pretty good um, or on the left side fall off but here I think we went just a little bit too far to the right so let's maybe cut this down to 35 and those are things to play with until it starts feeling really realistic, like your image is really hitting at the right times. Um, so that's good. Let's add the next piece, which is going to be, let's just come up into our initial platforms, and here's where we can see if we set it up correctly, because we're going to add a whole bunch of platforms to this list. And hopefully the way we wrote the code, um, this is just going to draw them all on once we give them these four coordinates that rectangles need. So um, let's go ahead and make one that's going to be a little bit higher and to the left and one that's a little bit higher to the right. Um, and what we're really doing is we're creating the platforms that will be on the screen when the game starts up. And once, uh, what I'd like to do is once you um, go high enough that the screen starts moving downward and you need to produce more platforms higher up, I'd like to make that procedurally generated with a little element of randomness that should add some difficulty to the game. You could define a really long list of um, platforms that get progressively more difficult and make it like a, a constant, always the same, like scripted type of game. I uh, prefer doing it this way, but those are the fun things that can really make this game your own and, and add some variation to it. So for now, I'm just going to make these first two, and I think they'll be up and to the left and up and to the right. Um, so here we go. And you can see the player just gets high enough to get on those platforms, and that's really cool. You can tell we can just jump back and forth between these platforms. We haven't, ended, we haven't added uh, death conditions, and we also haven't added like limits on the sides. 
Um, so I can go infinitely left and infinitely down and infinitely right right now. Um, and we'll get to that later, but let's go ahead and just create the whole starting screen um, list of platforms so that uh, basically we can jump around while we're testing the game um, between place to place. And let's just make it the way those first three um, platforms looked. Let's just kind of replicate that uh, a few more times. So we're going up by 110 each time. And uh, let's see, 175, 260. So then the next two should be up at, what, 150. And then we'll do one more at uh, 175, 40, 70, 10. So let's go ahead, Control C. And again, you do not need to follow the locations of my platforms. If you want to make it procedurally generated from the jump, you certainly go ahead. Um, the reason I create a starting platform screen is so I know at least when the game loads in, I know roughly how it's going to look. So here we've got this nice figure eight. And I haven't put anything in yet um, to handle like how you're going to return um, or how the screen's going to move upward and generate new platforms. But this way I can at least see that like wherever the player is loading in on, I like the look of that screen. And that's um, not a bad idea to know that like right when you spawn in, you're not going to die right away because that's really frustrating. And just make sure the overall look and feel of the game is pretty good without adding the really complex mechanics of like creating procedurally generated platforms. Okay, so that's my spiel. Let's keep going. Um, that looks pretty good. We've got our initial platforms, and you could see I could jump on all of them. Uh, the motion was really smooth, gliding up and down. It felt like it was about the right spots when I could fall off to the left and fall off to the right. Um, so I think the next thing we should do is update our platform locations based on where the player is, because if you remember Doodle Jump, you can move kind of constantly upward, um, but the screen will never move um, back down. So as you progress, if a tile goes off to the bottom of the screen, that tile's gone. You can never land on it again, but new tiles should be coming from above. And that's a really important thing to do in a game that's going to be kind of an infinite jumper. So let's go ahead and add that now. Um, and I think we should do that with a function that I'll call update platforms. So we'll go down where we call our other functions, check collisions and update the player. And we're going to update the platforms as well. And so to do that, we are going to have our um, list of their locations, which is, uh, you know, equal to platforms. And we are going to update it using a function that we'll call update platforms. So we are going to take the position of the player so we're going to need to pass in a few things, the actual list of um, coordinates that we're modifying, and then the player's Y coordinate, um, and then how much it's changing by in the Y direction. And this is going to help us uh, know how much we need to modify the location of the platforms. So let's go up where we're defining functions up here, and let's actually update platforms. So handle movement of platforms as game progresses. And so this may not seem intuitive because we're moving upward, but the way to actually get that to look, um, the way to get that to look like um, you're moving upward is actually move the platforms in the background if you have an image, uh, move them downward because you're not actually going to roll your screen, you know, up progressively. You're going to move all of the background objects downward. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. We're going to define this function. We're going to call it update platforms, and we're passing in a list that I'll just call my list. You can call it platform list or anything like that. Um, and then we are passing in the Y position. I'll call it Y position. Um, and then we're passing in the Y change. I'll just call that, I'll just call that change because we're only dealing with one direction of change here. And in this platform, update platforms function, uh, we want to check if the player's Y position has gotten high enough on the screen that we want to be moving things downward. And if you remember, the player Y is at the top of the, the player's head. So if we say when the player is roughly in the middle of the screen, that's when you've gone high enough that I'd like to push things down. Then what we want to check 
as if the player Y is actually less than whatever value we decide is an appropriate time to move stuff downward. Um, I'll throw 250 in here to start, and we may want to modify that while we're playing around. Um, but then the other piece is we want to make sure Y change is uh, negative. And this way, it'll only... So Y change being negative means you're jumping upward, and that means that only while you're going higher will we move things down. We won't be making the, the tiles move lower and lower as you're also falling. That would make the game really difficult. Uh, and you may want to do it that way in your version of the game. That's something you can play around with. This is how I'm choosing to make mine. Um, so now we're going to do some familiar stuff because we're doing another for loop that's going to check through the whole um, the whole list of parameters. So we'll say for i in range, and then the range is going to be the length of my list, the list that we're passing in. And so we're creating a for loop that's going to iterate through all of the uh, coordinates in the list of coordinates that we pass through and we're checking to see if my list and then um, whatever the item I is gonna be um, and then we're gonna check its first coordinate and uh, if that is I in range minus yeah okay <laughs> sorry I got a little confused here um, I thought we were on the part where we're eliminating them. So what we're doing is we're looping through the entire list and we're checking to see if the player has gone high enough that we want to move um, all of the platforms down. We're going to move them and we're going to move them by Y change. So as you're going upwards, we're going to move them down at whatever speed you're moving up with. And that's how we're going to handle constantly moving the platforms down. Again, you can do this other ways. You could make that a constant like minus 1 or minus 2. If that's something you want to play around with, be sure to play around with it. Um, and so this is how we're going to handle that. And actually, we just called it change. So be careful about that. And change. So make sure you get your... And actually, this is Y position. Make sure you check through and make sure everything that you're using in here is uh, is equal to... Oh, and this should not be an if. This should be just my list. Sorry, a little scrambled. This is a long tutorial. Um, so make sure all of the variables that you use in here are the same as the variables that you bring in or that you redefine them in your function. Um, okay, so that's part one. What we're doing here is we're saying when you get up above a certain height, go ahead and move downward. Now let's go ahead and add the piece um, that's going to add platforms to the top of the screen and remove them from the bottom of the screen uh, if necessary. So let's go ahead and say else pass just to get over this. Whoops. Else. Else. Uh, just to get out of this if loop, because if statement, because now we're going to do an, uh, another loop. And so for this one, we're going to say for, and instead of just I, I'm going to say item for this one. Uh, you can reuse I, certainly. Like the, There's no reason you can't use the same indexer for both of these. Um, but since this is kind of a, a list that's doing a totally different function, um, or, or this uh, for loop is doing a totally different function. I want to separate it out into a separate counter. And now what we're going to do, and um, I should have probably talked about it, we're addressing a list inside of a list here with this double indexing. So the for in range of my list, this i, is going to go through our list of coordinates, um, like this platform's coordinates list, and it's going to grab... Um, a whole set of these for each value of i. So this is 0, this is 1, this is 2. And then if we want to address a specific element inside of it, which in this case is its y location, which is this value, then we want to do this double brackets. Um, and so this is what we're doing with the 1 here. So we're saying um, my list i, and that's going to grab the coordinates one set at a time, and then one is checking its actual y location. And so that's what we're doing here is we're subtracting the downward movement from the y location, and that'll get the platforms moving downward. Okay, 
So a uh, little bit more backstory on what we're doing there, and that'll help with this. So if my list item one, so again, the Y coordinate, if that goes greater than 500, you're now off the screen to the bottom, and the screen isn't going to ever move back up. So it's effectively gone forever. Um, and we don't want the player to be able to jump off of tiles that are below the screen anyways. If you hit the bottom of the screen when we get to it, that'll be game over conditions. Um, so then what do we want to do? Well, we could do it one of two ways. We could eliminate that item from the list and then add a new one. But I propose that we just reassign that item some place above the screen and then use that as the next platform to come in. That's a, one way to do an infinite, um, like an infinite platformer game where you have like roughly the same number of platforms on the screen forever. That's another reason creating like seven to start will ensure that you always have a pretty decent chance of having a platform that you can hit. The other, the really sophisticated, like elegant, long version of this tutorial would include showing how to make sure that whatever platform is being spawned in has valid pathing. Like it's not more than 100 pixels to the left or right of the current highest platform. Um, maybe in a future tutorial, if that is something uh, interesting that you guys would like to see as a continuation of this one, just let me know. But for now, what we're going to do when we uh, have a platform go off the screen below, um, I propose we just create a new platform where the last two elements will be the same. So it'll be 70 and 10. Those are going to be the um, those are going to be the width and the height of them. But I say we make a random random integer. So this random dot rand int, uh, we have to import it because that's another module just like Pygame we have to import. Um, but once we import it, then all this random integer value needs is it needs uh, a range. So for the x coordinate, we're going to go between 0 and 330. That's the entire screen. Uh, if we wanted to make sure it was maybe a little bit inside the bounds, we could do uh, 10 and 320. Why don't we actually do that? That way it's not pressed up against a wall. That could always look kind of funny. Um, but okay, so then we'll do random dot rand int as well for the y coordinate. And here, if you think about it, um, we want it to be off the screen, above the screen, and then start coming down as the player's coming down. And so I propose we say from 50 pixels above the screen all the way down to 10 pixels above the screen is where it could be created. So 10 pixels above the screen, again, this coordinate is the top left. So that's actually pressed right up against the top of the screen because it's 10 pixels thick. And then 50 above the screen is really the bottom of it. It'll be 40 pixels above the screen. If you start noticing, like when you play it, that this makes your game way too difficult, you can tighten this range or this range um, to ensure that uh, it, it comes in a little bit closer than that so you don't have a real high jump that you have to make. But uh, we're, we're going to start here for now and we're going to run it a few times whoops and we're going to run it a few times and take a look and see if that does it for us um so okay four item in range yep and then we have to pass this list back because that is what update platforms is expecting it is looking for um it is looking for the list back so jump equals check collisions we'll give it an extra space that's fine Let's go ahead and see. I'm sure we may have missed something here, but let's see. That was kind of cool. We get platforms moving upwards, and uh, you can see like it, it just looks pretty good. The spacing we chose there makes it pretty fair. Um, while you're going up, the platforms move down. This really <laughs> feels a lot like the original Doodle Jump, um, and it looks pretty good. So let's start adding the things that really make this like a fun game. Uh, where you'd you know call your friends over to have them play it because right now it's fun for the developer who made it um, and maybe your buddies would tell you like oh it's fun but let's start um, taking it the extra mile so the first little thing I want to look at is let's have the player face whichever direction he's moving this is going to be a pretty easy ad but it's going to look real fun so right now it always looks like he's looking to the right I think we should make it to where if the player's going to the left, he's looking to the left. So how would we go about adding that is going to be pretty easy because we already have a variable that's telling us which direction the player is moving. So 
all we have to do is look at if x change, right? Because that's the variable um, that's determining that's determining if you're going left or right. So if it's positive, then what we want is, and we're going to take this whole row of code where we defined the player, and we're just going to bring that down here. We're going to keep it. So uh, if x change is moving to the right, we want to keep it exactly as is. Um, and then let's add l if x change is negative. And uh, the reason I don't just say else is if you add an else statement here, then what it's also going to look at is the zero condition. And we only want to change it when it's positive or negative. And then when it is equal to zero, which is not moving, we want it to stay looking whichever direction it was looking last. If you made one of these if and then the other one else, then any time you weren't moving, it would look back to one direction or the other. This way that we're doing it here is going to keep it um, is going to keep it looking um, whichever direction it was when it was last moving. And so we're going to do when we are going left because the image obviously loads in facing right. If your image was loading in facing left, you would just do the flip on the right condition. But it's another transform, and it's transform flip. Put this whole thing in parentheses now, and you give it two, um, two true or false, one or zero values in here. You give what if you want it to flip on the x-axis, and then you give it if you want to flip on the y-axis. So it may look like there's a lot of things going on in here, but all we have is pull in the actual image. That's the pygame.image.load. Then we have scale it down to size, and that's this guy. And then we have flip it. And you definitely could store like this piece just in the variable player. And then you could replace all of this with player. Um, I'm going to do it this way. I think it's a little bit easier. Uh, it's just easy for me to see the whole line of code here. Um, and that should be all we need to do to get him moving left when we're going left. And then he stays looking left if we leave it there. Um, and then, come on, stay down here. And then if I go left a little bit, he stays looking left, and I really like that look. I think it looks um, a lot of fun. It looks just like the actual game, which if you're trying to model something that exists, you might as well go for close to the source material, right? Um, okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, why don't we go ahead and add some score tracking? And I think the proper way to score this game would be the number of platforms you've gotten to remove from the board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up into my game constants, and when the game starts, I'm going to uh, just say the score is equal to zero, and I'm actually going to do some high score tracking while we're in here as well. Um, and to do high score tracking, we're going to have to also track when game is over, which we probably should have thrown in by now, but uh, whatever. <laughs> okay, so uh, when we do replace a image when we replace a platform I want to use that as the um, score conditions and we already have a spot that's checking to see if it's time to replace the platforms so rather than even really modifying the line of code that calls things in I say we just call score as a global and add the line of code here that's going to be score plus one anytime a platform disappears off the bottom of the screen um, so that's the purpose of this line and then what we have to do to actually get the score displaying, and I talked about this real early in the process, but we need to do a two-step process to get score drawing onto the screen. And what that means is we need to make score text, and then we have to blit it onto the screen. So uh, to do a text, you do font, which we defined earlier in the game variables, and then dot render, and this is how Pygame handles putting text on the screen. And so you do font.render, and the first thing you give it is the actual text that uh, you want to have displayed. And for this, it's just going to be score, and then a colon, and then a string conversion of score. So hopefully you're familiar with Python concatenation of strings. Um, but basically, you can use this plus sign character to bring multiple strings together, but it only works as long as they're the st same data type. So we have to use this str function to convert our score into a string. And once we've done that, then the only other things that the font render needs is um, a, a few things that are basically going to be the same for all of your text. It's going to be true. And then the color you want the text to be, 
and then the color you want the background to be. And I would like it to just blend in with the background. So currently that would be white, but if we want it to be exactly the same as our background, then we'll go with background. Um, and then uh, let's go ahead and do the second piece, which is we do screen dot blit, just like we did with the player, and we need to blit the score text onto the screen and we need to give it a location. So uh, I would like it to be, I think, in the top right of the screen. Um, and let's pick some coordinates that'll be roughly in the top uh, right of the screen. Um, we'll say 3, 20, and 20 down from the top. And we'll just take a look at how that looks. And if this looks good, then we can go ahead and add the high score um, right underneath it. That should be all we need to do when we load up the game. We get score in the top. That looks pretty good. Let's see if we, yep. So we get platforms to fall off the bottom, and that updates the score. So that's working properly. Let's go ahead and get high score drawn on there as well, and then let's add game over conditions and uh, restart conditions next. So uh, we'll just take this because we're already in the area. Let's copy it. And let's do high score text and high score text. And we're going to need to update its location a little bit um, because obviously if we were to leave it right here, it would be drawing right on top of it. Uh, okay. So for the high score text, let's move it up a little bit or uh, I guess uh, left a little bit and then up a little bit. So let's just see how it looks at the very top at zero. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so that's cool, except it says score um, instead of high score. The reason I uh, the reason I made it longer is because I knew that um, that the word high score was going to take up some extra space, and I'd like them yeah to be pretty much in line there. Uh, now what we need to do is we need to actually um, we need to actually monitor high score tracking. Um, and this is really going to matter more once we have the ability to play multiple times. But um, all I'm going to say, this is pretty easy. If score is ever greater than high score, then high score equals score. That should be pretty logical to you guys right there. We're saying if you ever get to a point where the current score that you have is higher than the high score, store that value into the high score variable. And that's really all we need to do because once we are losing, getting game over, and then resetting it to where you can play again, um, we're going to reset the score, but we're not going to reset the high score. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to handle hitting the bottom of the screen, losing the game. Uh, we already created a game variable called game over, I believe. Yep, and it starts out false when the game starts because you start just above a platform that you're going to start bouncing on. So you don't have to do anything to start the game except load it up. Let's look at where we're updating the player's Y position. Because another thing I don't want to have happen is I don't want your character to fall completely off the screen. I want this to only happen if the player's Y uh, coordinate is less than 440. So basically checking to see that your feet are still on the screen. If it's below the screen, then you've fallen off the screen. Um, and so basically else is going to be game over equals true. And let's go ahead and say y change is going to be equal to zero. So no matter that gravity is still affecting you, you're going to be just sitting there on the bottom of the screen, unable to move, unable to do anything. Um, okay, and while we're down here, let's just add some parameters so the player uh, can't go too far to the left and too far to the right. So right by the X changes, let's go ahead and just say as long as the player X um, is still in the screen, it can do whatever it wants. Um, but let's say, and again, this may be different if you've pulled in a different image. Um, I know that the overhang of my image is about 20 pixels to the left and to the right. So if it's ever less than negative 20, that means it's really gone too far to the left. And I'm just going to force it back to the screen. So this is kind of an inelegant brute force way of monitoring your limits. Um, you can actually reference your image, check for the X and Y extremities, and then um, do it based off of that. 
or you can kind of guess and check, see when you're slamming into either side of the screen um, and set some limits based off of that. So what I just put in here is saying if you hit the left wall, because again, my white space to the left of the doodle jump character is about 20 pixels either direction. So this is checking to see if you've gone to the left wall or the right wall and you're slamming into it and just prevents you from going any further. So let's go ahead and see. Uh, we haven't put in a way to uh, get out of it if game over is true, and I'm not sure we've said everything that game over should do yet, but let's just see what happens if we land on the ground. So actually this is perfect for testing because you can see I can still go left and right. Um, but I'm no longer jumping because uh, game over has to be false for me to be jumping. Um, and the Y change is equal to zero. So why don't we also say that you can only move to the X, um, you can only move to the right or to the left when, um, when game over is not true. So player movement is stopped as well. And to do that, we can just say X change is always equal to zero if game over is true. So here I can click the arrows if I really want to, and I can get to move once at a time, but if I hold it down, he doesn't move. I think that's um, kind of a good way of doing game over, but there's a million different ways you could do it. You could actually limit the key up conditions um, and say if event.key is equal to this and game over is false, or you could do that for your whole key down section, and that way none of the keys, if you had a whole bunch of... Um, different commands like shooting and jumping and ducking and you didn't want any of those to work you could take your whole key down event handler section and add the and not game over condition um, I'm okay if you want to do that I'm not going to do that for this game uh, but what I am going to add is if the key down is true and the event dot key uh, is case space so I'm going to bring the space bar into it now dot k underscore space and game over I'm gonna use this as my reset so the game's over you're dead and you want to reinitialize the game hit the space bar to play again and this is only gonna work when game over is true and what we need to do now is we need to stuff a whole bunch of conditions that are gonna set the game back equal to zero and um, so basically this is think of everything we need to do when we restart the game we set game over back equal to false that's kind of the first one and the obvious one we're gonna set our score back equal to zero we're gonna put the player X um, back in his initial position and the player Y position back to the initial where we start them uh, and then we also need to reset the background because if it changed during the course of the game, we want it to be white again. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to copy all of our platforms because we need the platforms to go back to their starting positions if we're putting the player back in his starting position. And that should let you replay the game. And so uh, once we make sure that this is working as expected and we've checked for any issues, um, we'll also add some text that's only up when game is over, saying spacebar to restart, something like that. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if I can get a few points just so the high score will update. And let's see if I can die now. It shouldn't be too bad. All right, so uh, we got a high score of 13. The high score doesn't change, but you can see the player goes back to his starting position and the score restarts, starts incrementing. Um, so that's pretty sweet. Why don't we get a few more uh, pieces added? Because there are some things like uh, super high jump, like power up, that I think would be good to add. Um, there are some things like changing backgrounds and uh, a few other game pieces. So you do have the core of the game built right now. Hopefully you've been enjoying this. And I'm going to start showing how you can add functionality into the game now to really go that extra step. And hopefully you'll enjoy that. So... Why don't we do, um, first thing, why don't we do a uh, changing color background? And to do that, I want to say, let's say every time you were to score 15 points, um, we're going to give you a new background color, and let's make it any color, any random color. Um, so to do that, let's say if the score minus a new variable we're going to create called score last, which is going to check the last time the color uh, changed, if that's more than 15, that means you haven't had a new color change in uh, 15 points. We're going to 
make score last equal to score, so that's going to effectively reset it. And then we're going to make background equal to this uh, random dot rand int, just like we did, uh, just like we did in the beginning. And we're going to make it any color. So the range on um, the range on RGBs is zero to two five five. Since the player and the platforms are black, I'd like to avoid ever having like a completely invisible game. So I'd like to avoid, even though it's insanely rare. Like I'm sure somebody knows the somebody knows the probability of getting two five five, two five five, two five five, or zero 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 in this game. Um, but if you were to get black, you would have zero uh, zero zero. The absence of or no, I'm sorry, that'd be white. I'm getting twisted. This has been a really long tutorial. Right. If you were to get black, which would be 0, 0, 0, you'd actually be in some trouble because everything would be invisible. So we'll start the range at 1, and we'll go to 255, 255, 255. And we're going to do that three times. Um, so we're going to just bring in three random integers in the RGB range uh, other than black. And we're going to make that the background color. And this should be all we need to do, I believe, let's go ahead and run it, see if I can get above 15. Score Right, I never made the variable scored last. I said I was going to. Um, okay, so we need at the beginning of the game, we want it to be equal to 0. And then we also, this is another variable, uh, we want to add to our game over reset and make score last equal to 0. So something to keep in mind, once you've added your game over conditions, and it's actually a reason I put it in fairly late, is if if you do put game over in pretty early on and you start adding variables, you need to create them in the beginning of the program, but you also may need to reinitialize all of that in your game over code, and that can actually lead to some very complicated code. Um, let's go ahead and see if I can get 15, and maybe we'll get a cool background color. Maybe it'll be terrible. Who knows? There we go. So I got 17. That's fun. You can see the doodle. Um, this is why I really like removing the background of objects because um, it really it looks like the see-through little character. If you have a filled-in one, no matter, um, that'll still look cool. But if it was a standard like um, if it was a standard background like a block white rectangle, it's going to look pretty bad here. Um, so I recommend getting a image with the background stripped. And you can see just while I'm playing this, like every 15-ish, sometimes it's 16. Um, the score, the background color is changing, and it's randomly generated, and that's really cool. So why don't we add one more thing, and then we'll add a little more text. Why don't we add like a super jump or an air jump um, that just gives the player like one more thing they can do. So we'll call them super jumps, and in the beginning of the game, we'll give you two. And so this is another thing we need to reinitialize every game over. Game over. Let's set them back equal to two. And what I think would be cool for the super jump is if you hit the space bar and at any point it gave you like a real good boost. So if you had to span like a larger than normal gap, you could hit space and that would launch you up high. Or it would give you the ability to do like a double jump. Um, so I think this would be cool. And why don't we add some conditions? Because we have here if event.key is space and game is over. Let's just add that exact thing, but all we have to change is and not game over. Um, and so if you do that, we only want this to happen if you have a super jump. So we're going to check that super jumps variable, and we're going to check to see that it's greater than zero. And if it is greater than zero, then we are going to do two things. We are going to take one away from your super jumps total. So that's a minus equal one. And then we are also going to just set that Y change. So wherever you are, if you're floating in air, already jumping, or if you're sitting on a platform, let's just launch the Y change to minus 15. So it'll initially send you hurtling upwards at... 15 um, pixels, which, you know, with gravity will scan down real fast. But that's a little higher than a normal jump. You can play around with this setting um, and see where you get to where you really like it. Um, but let's also make it collectible. So as you do better and better in the game, you get one more per however often you want. I'm going to do it per 50. So I'm going to need another uh, variable. But I will say if score minus jump last, so I'll make this new one tracking the last time we gave you a super jump. 
And if you got 50 points, we're going to do two things that are going to be very similar to what we did for the color. We're going to set jump last equal to score. And then we'll take your super jumps total and we'll add one to it. So this is giving you a super jump in the game if you get above 50. Uh, so we need to make jump last in the beginning, just like we did with score last. And we need to set equal to zero. And then we also need to go into our game over conditions and set it equal to zero there as well. So a lot of people will create some initialized code, put it in a function, and then when game over happens and you reset it, they'll run that function one time as well. That would probably be a more Pythonic way of doing this. I will say that. Um, I've kind of come this far, so I'm going to just stick with this. But uh, a lot of people would take this initialization stuff that also happens at the very beginning of the code. They would start the code by running it once, and then call it once, once this uh, these sort of conditions happen as well. <clears throat> We're going to leave it here, and let's go ahead and test our super jumps. One more thing, in the same fashion that we put uh, score and high score on the screen, I want to put some stuff about how many jumps you have left. So we'll say uh, air jumps, and then why don't we also just tell them, like, space bar. This way I can get around having to uh I can get around having to leave like an instructions menu somewhere. I can just tell them on the screen. Um and again, this is like make it your game. If you don't like how this looks once I throw it on the screen, put it wherever you want. If you want to make a menu, make yourself a menu. Um I'm gonna just do it this way. And I'm gonna put this in the top left. We've already got stuff in the top right. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh and then why don't we also add game over text, game over text, that's going to say game over, and then we'll also have it say, whoops, we'll have it say game over space bar to restart. Okay, so we're just telling them you lost and, uh, you know, click the space bar to play again. And let's pick somewhere a little bit more central to throw this. So it'll still be at the top of the screen. And this would be the kind of text most people, I think, in most games would make this quite a bit larger. Um, I'm just trying to kind of proof of concept this one for you. And obviously, we only want that one to write onto the screen if game over is actually true. So we'll say if game over, write these onto the screen. And that should do it. All right, let's go ahead and take a look because we added a lot of stuff here. So since I'm just standing here and it's, whoops, stop and rerun. Since it's just sitting here um, looking good, I'm going to go ahead and try the space bar right now. And you can see that was a real high jump. That was pretty sweet. And it took one away from my air jumps. Um, so why don't I see if I can get to 50, make sure that I get one new um, jump. I had to use my other one there because I'm not very good at this game. I'm at 34, though, so this shouldn't take real long. And 39, 40. I'm also trying to hit the space bar right now, making sure that I don't have any available jumps and I actually can't jump again. So um, this is pretty good. I got another one. I can use it up. And the background's changing, so that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and die. Uh, oh, okay, so uh, I forgot to update the second piece of this font rendering. So I changed game over text but then I didn't change the name of what we're blitting onto the screen. So let's go ahead and run that and take a look here. Game over text. Game over, spacebar to restart. Spacebar restarts, and there we go. So I'm super happy with this game. There are about a million ways you could make this. The extra step, you could take it um, to the next level. You could add backgrounds. You could add additional player functionality like a shooting you could create some platforms that disappear with one use. You could create some platforms with a little spring on them that'll launch you upward. That's kind of how the original dual jump worked. Um, you know, you could add sound effects, you could add anything you want, and then you could package it um, as long as you weren't actually using like copyrighted uh, images like I am. There are so many ways to make this game your own. Uh, if there are enough people with enough interest in seeing some things like adding sound, adding background images, um, adding a function where you can go through the left wall onto the right wall, I can do things like that. Just let me know there's some interest in the comments below. Um, otherwise, I'm planning on this tutorial video kind of being a self-packaged, all-in-one 
um, deal. If you did decide to follow this tutorial and you did add some additional functionality to make it your own, let me know what you did uh, in the comments below. I'd love to see um, some of your guys' projects and how you took them the extra step. If you did find this useful, be sure to check out the channel as there are tons of additional Python tutorials on there um, and new content comes out every week. If you uh, have been following along, have been enjoying the channel, be sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a ton. It's a pretty new channel and I'm just getting going. So uh, it's really great to know there's some interest. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, as always, good luck with your code and thanks for watching. Thanks. Bye.